get on the bus. Get on the bus. Drink the Kool Aid, Ben. Get on the bus. <laughs> Hi, Michelle. Geordie, Geordie. Hello. How you diddling? I'm diddling Swedish style. I'm back in the land of Sweden. It's beautiful. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. It is summer in the Northern Hemisphere, so uh, us eavesdropping ladies are enjoying a bit of sunshine. It's nice right now. It is sunny. just hasn't been the glorious high 20s that we're used to in July. And there's your fucking weather report. Shut up. Yeah, I always get slammed for doing the fucking do. weather report and you dive straight in. You know why? Because it is actually... We're about to go on summer holiday. That's why. We're all going on a summer holiday. holiday. <laughs> yes, that's right. We're off to France on a driving holiday, which is always nice. And, you know, for us ladies who grew up in Australia and a lot of Australian listeners out there, hi. It's just like driving to Queensland from Victoria. That's what I would compare it to. You stop off a, a couple of places on the way. And then you get to the other other side. You get to the sunnier, hotter lands. Well, we drove here, drove to Sweden. Yeah. How long did it take? 23 hours. Whoa. And we did it nonstop. Four <gasps> drivers. Weren't you with some teenagers? Teenagers. They've got the energy. <laughs> I don't have that energy. Were you catching flies in the back seat or did you have to have the front seat because you're the oldest? How dare you? But you are. They're teenagers. I know. It's true. I have... I call it my magic hood. It's kind of <laughs> weird. You think we can't see you with your mouth wide open, snoring, but we can. <laughs> it's real. It's not like a, a cloak of magic. It's more, <laughs> my sister's got kids and she had those muslins, you know, for the babies. And yeah. I stole one. Whenever I travel, I put it over my head. I look yeah. like a mummy. But as soon as that thing goes on, I am out like a light and no one can see catching flies well those things are quite transparent aren't they i could just imagine the shroud of turin lying there <laughs> in state like you put it on and three hours later it's uh it's someone else's turn to drive not yours and you move right along so that sounds like uh like a cross-atlantic boat ride or something would you like to borrow it for your france trip no thank you anyway that's my top tip Top well, tip for the day. There you go, travel and weather. I think it's time we introduce ourselves. Oh, why don't we? Who are you? I'm Michelle, and who are you? I'm Geordie. Hello, <laughs> welcome to Eavesdropping, the weekly real life true crime supernatural podcast. Also, a bit of comedy. Well, we like to think we're keeping it light because sometimes it's heavy. It's dark. And today it might be a little bit heavy. Oh. So, warning, warning. Boop, 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 boop. Okay. But before we hit that, stuff the meat as you like to call it Michelle I just want to go back a couple of weeks okay you were at my house I bumped into my postman Dan I gave him a big hug I gave him a hug I know you did I spied on you both because he rang the doorbell I was at work I pressed the button on my ring doorbell and I saw canoodling on my doorstep canoodling how dare and I texted you immediately to say get your grubby mitts off my (laughs) posting well anyway he said he couldn't help himself he just had to give you a hug because he says you've got a cheeky glint oh cheeky glint oh I love that Dan I think that's what he said glint not don't be rude you're disgusting (laughs) no Cheeky glint in my in my sparkling blue eyes. <laughs> That's what That's he meant. Right. Oh no! Do you know what? I opened the door. There he was, and it was like seeing an, an old friend. Oh, oh, Dan! Hello. Oh, Dan! It's lovely. There's your shout out, shout Dan, because he is still listening week in week out. So if anyone's got any messages for my posty, Dan, just write in. He's a lovely person. And Dan, we we will have that jam roly poly date coming up soon. He said he got it slightly wrong and said something about spotted dick. He did. But uh, <laughs> shocked, <laughs> a spot of spotted dick. But no, Dan's lovely. I'm glad he's still listening. Thanks for hanging in there, Dan. And thanks to everyone else who's been voting. We really appreciate yes. it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Listener's Choice, British Podcast Awards. We're linking it up. Go and vote if you haven't already done it. We love you. Go to the website, British Podcast Awards. There's a page to vote for the Listener's Choice. You can go on our social media as well, Instagram, is eavesdropping no g underscore and it's not no g you don't have to spell that out it's just eavesdropping (laughs) underscore 
And then you can find all the links on our current social medias, uh, of which there should be plenty to view. Also, another listener on the Instagram did write in, I missed it, unfortunately, but now I've seen it. Shout out to Yasmin Element, who told us she had a dream about eavesdropping. No. We're in her dreams. What? We're the podcast of her dreams. Amazing. Uh, don't tell me, was it the end song? Eavesdropping. It's an earworm. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, she didn't say that, but she said in this dream, Yasmin was conducting a sightseeing coach tour in Russia. I don't know if that's her day job and that's why she was dreaming about it. I have a feeling she had been really scrolling a lot before bedtime and I'll tell you why. So in this dream, there were two seats in front of her on the coach, but she was too shy. Despite being a coach tour operator, she was too shy to say hello to us. But then Ben Mendelssohn got on and he sat <laughs> right next to Yasmin. So she had to get her attention to say, look at me. Can you believe this? I've got Ben Mendelssohn sitting next to me. And then we all got together. The brown lemonades were cracked open and a good time was had by all. Selfies flying around and lots of Russians doing things just like they would on the look at this Russian Instagram page. So she must follow that, which I do as well. It's quite fun. I'd just like to say, Yasmin, dreams can come true. You got our attention, but where the fuck is Ben? I think we need to be on that bus. We need to be on the Ben bus. I want Ben on a bus. Or Ben could be on our eavesdropping bus. Seriously, you Ben, ben on get a bus? with the fucking Please. program. Get on the bus. Get on the bus. Drink the Kool-Aid, Ben. Get on the bus. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Poor Ben. Bless him. What's he up to these days? I mean, he was not good last time we chatted about Ben. Put a pin in that. I'm going to do some research on what's happened to old Ben. But thank you, Yasmin. Amazing dream. I just want to say something else. I just saw it on my friend's feed on Facebook. I know it's for middle-aged people. My friend, Moira, we've spoken about her before. Yes. Uh, She's actually the reason why we did the Paul is Dead episode a few weeks ago, because she had pointed it out to me after I, obviously, I'm going to say it again, bumped into Paul McCartney. You know, this is what happens when you live in London and you live a glamorous life like I do. (laughs) She just posted... There's a new film starring Simon Pegg and it is covering a very exciting to me story that we did cover quite some time ago, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. It's actually oh. about the man that was sent over to the Isle of Man to investigate Jeff the Talking Mongoose. Michelle will link up this episode in case you haven't heard it yet. It's a stonking story. I love it. Don't know whether or not we did it justice, but it's one of my faves, Supernatural Stories. What's his name? Nandor Fodor. We've spoken about him more than once because he's popped up a few times in some of our supernatural stories. But there's a new film starring Simon Pegg as Nandor Fodor based on Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I cannot wait. I think we have to watch that together. I agree. That's a a daiquiri and some sweet salty popcorn evening in front of... What, you don't like that? I would say daiquiri and... Doritos with guacamole or something. Well, I'll take that too. Would be more appropriate. Or even a margarita, not a daiquiri. Yeah, a margarita and something salty. What's wrong with the sweet salty popcorn? I don't like that. I fucking love that. You get the sweet yeah. and you get the salty. It's heaven in a bag. In a bag? In a bag of popcorn. I would have popped my popcorn from the kernels. From scratch. I do like to do things from scratch, yes. I do too, but there? I don't know. They put some kind of MS. Geez, shit. I don't know what they put in, but it's addictive. Something that you like. Love it. Can I just segue away from popcorn for one moment, please, Michelle? Yes. Because I have breaking news. It's probably broken because obviously we are going on our holidays. So this is a couple of episodes in advance. But I had a message from our very own modern mystic, Tamira, who sent us something really crazy. You may or may not know about this. She said, a large metal type canister was found in a beach called Durian Bay in Greenhead, which is about 250 kilometres north of Perth in Australia, around the 17th of July, 2023. Police are, were, I don't know if they're still there, probably not two weeks later, police were guarding the object and they say it's being treated as hazardous until they can determine what it is. Fuck. A local had found it in the water and pulled it to shore and apparently it's all beaten up, big metal. It looks like a, a small silo or a large septic tank. Don't let the Americans get their hands on that because huh? it's going to be alien reverse technology shit. 
Obviously. It may not be. Okay. It could also be, they're saying it could be an Indian space rocket or a piece from a space station that's fallen down. But everybody that was there, all the services were all in hazmat suits. Holy Ooh. fuck. Do you know what? That's probably more scary than that bit of film we watched where the cocaine dropped out of the sky for a movie called huh? Cocaine Bear. Oh, Cocaine Bear. <laughs> Fucking hell, what a ridiculous. We didn't watch that. We did it. I didn't watch we it. We saw it on Gogglebox. We didn't need to watch it. We saw enough. Oh, we saw enough of enough. it. Well, I had also some feedback. Not so much on the episode, but definitely Courtney and Kurt. It is controversial. People get really wound up about that. Really? Have you been having arguments with people in the street? Yes, I have, as always. <laughs> I would say that 90% of the people I chatted to about the episode thought Courtney had something to do with Kurt's death right it's really really fascinating and in fact when I pressed one friend about why he thought that he basically said she might not have pulled the trigger but he thinks she was a psychological mastermind who fucked with his head so much that she kind of manipulated him into killing himself what do you think of that? Well, I did read the Hirschberg interview after the episode because I was so interested after Michelle's expose or, well, I wouldn't call it an expose. I felt like she definitely manipulated her way into his life and into becoming her husband. And she was quite open about that in the interview. But on listening to our episode and all of your information that you presented, it made me think, well, what use was he to her dead? He would have earned more money alive and she would have benefited by being the mother of his child in some way. She has benefited from it, even though there was this, what do you call it, the prenup. I don't think she had anything to do with his death. And I do think that perhaps the suicide note was doctored or maybe there was no suicide note in the beginning and maybe it was put together. One thing that did occur to me, did they plan it together? Did she know he was going to do it? And was it her one final thing that she did for him, which was to not stop him? It's possible, but they'd had the intervention just days before. And there's an American interview that she did with, is it Barbara Walters? Possibly. Directly after Kurt's yeah. death. She's bizarre. It's like she's acting. And she says, I feel like I killed him because, you know, I'm, I was doing that tough love thing of let's have the intervention. If you don't do this, we're all walking away from you. And she said, I shouldn't have done that. She said she feels some guilt. I mean, you know, she's a, a grieving widow who's also a junkie. So I, I don't know, that may have something to do with it. But there's also in the Nick Broomfield documentary that I slagged, Kurt and Courtney, there is an interview with the nanny, not Callie the nanny, the dude, but another nanny before who quit. And she just said, listen, I was there in the months leading up to his suicide. And let me just tell you, from Courtney, there was a lot of will talk. Will? You need to make a will. Oh, will. What are you doing about the will? Who's going in the will? Come on, Kurt, you've got to make a will. Right. And she said she was terrified of Courtney. You can find whatever you want. You can find people saying she's yeah. amazing. You can find people saying she's an evil monster. But it is a really polarizing wow. subject. Well, I find her fascinating. And I think she was wild when she was younger. There's no doubt. I think yep. she's probably found a bit more peace in her, you know, her age that she's at now. And I always find her interesting. I'm fascinated by Courtney Love. I think she's uh, enigmatic. I enjoy her. I don't think she killed anyone. No, I enjoy controversial people and she's definitely controversial with really strong opinions. The other thing too is she says that she thinks Marlon Brando is her grandfather. Oh. So her grandmother is this really amazing writer actually called Paula Fox. I can't say that with my braces. <laughs> Fox. <laughs> Paula Fox is this really fantastic writer. There's a book she's written called Desperate Characters which is better than The Great Gatsby but not nearly as celebrated she was living with in a house with Stella Adler, who was his acting coach, and an unknown Marlon Brando was living in the house ah. at the time. She got pregnant, gave away her daughter, and then this woman is Courtney Love's mum. Then they trace back the lineage, and this woman, Paula Fox, met Courtney one time and just said, horrible, horrible woman, could not stand her, wow. never had any contact. And actually, if you put early pictures before all the surgery of Courtney and Marlon, there are some similarities. Wow. So. It's an interesting little fact. I know. She's an interesting woman. Courtney Love, if you didn't listen to it, go back, have a listen. It's interesting, if I do say so myself. <laughs> 
She made it awkward. She made, made it awkward. awkward. She How did I make it awkward? Awkward, awkward. She made it awkward. She made it awkward. How are you? Awkward, awkward, awkward. How bloody awkward! Well, this is awkward. How bloody awkward! Speaking of wrecks, I know we weren't speaking of wrecks, but I'm going to make a little recommendation for a podcast I listened to, which is from John Ronson. We love him. It was called The Debutante. And Michelle, that's the reason why I chose this story this week, because this week it's all about bombers, neo-Nazis, oh. bombers, neo-Nazis, yeah? neo-Nazis. neo-Nazis. The debutante, this podcast by John Ronson, it was him, John Ronson, investigating a woman called Carol Howe, who was a glamorous former debutante who became infatuated with the neo-Nazi movement responsible for the Oklahoma bombings before apparently switching sides to become a government informant. No spoilers here. Just go and listen. Wow. But it made me so fascinated because I'm always aghast that these right-wing fascist fanatics are able to gain so many followers. And there's a vintage episode of Louis Theroux's Weird Weekends, another recommendation there, Mm -hmm. called Louis and the Nazis, where Louis travels to California and spends time with the white Aryan resistance, which includes 11-year-old twin sisters, you may remember this episode, who have been taught to sing racist pop songs by their mother. Yes, I do. Actually, now that you say that little fact, yeah, I remember that. Viral. And also I learned through listening to Ronson's podcast about the Turner Diaries, which is some kind of manifesto for far right hate groups. Even reading the synopsis of the Turner Diaries on Wikipedia gave me the willies. Jesus. Basically, it is a 1978 novel by William Luther Pierce published under the pseudonym of Andrew MacDonald. And it's a fictional story make sure you remember that, of a violent revolution in the United States, which leads to the federal government being overthrown, a nuclear war, and ultimately a race war, which leads to the systematic extermination of non-whites and Jews and liberal sympathizers along with them until there are just no more non-white people left and everybody thinks the same. Not very nice. To me, it's chilling. Now, there have been some famous incidences in the past of terrorism from people who have used the Turner Diaries as a jumping off point. We've got Norwegian terrorist Annas Bering Breivik and the Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh, where both are said to be inspired by it. In fact, police found a copy of the book in the car of Timothy McVeigh, who blew up the Alfred P. Mara federal building in Oklahoma City on April 19th in 1995 and killed 168 people, including children, because there was a preschool in the building. In the book, there's this scene where a truck bomb does blow up the FBI headquarters and prosecutors were calling it a blueprint for the Oklahoma City bombing. Timothy McVeigh also reportedly sold the Turner Diaries at gun shows. And then going back to the Norwegian terrorist Anna's Bering Breivik, he murdered 77 young people and people generally in two terror attacks in Norway in July 22nd, 2011 and he had his own manifesto but it drew heavily upon the turner diaries right i've never heard of the turner diaries nor had i and i'm quite happy to be in a bubble where it doesn't exist yeah this book inspired more race hate groups that began to spring up such as the order whose members were responsible for the murder of a jewish radio host called alan berg now i didn't even know anything about that he was quite well known and he Mm. was assassinated by this group somebody else influenced by the book was the london nail bomber who was just 22 years old when he planned to start his own race war in London. His name is David Copeland. And I'm going to tell you the story because I lived in London, particularly you weren't living here at the time in uh, 1999, but Brixton and where I lived in Peckham and Camberwell, very close. I had friends who were actually there on the day this happened. So I'll tell you what happened. He orchestrated and carried out a series of bombs that caused terror over three successive weekends between the 17th and the 30th of April in 1999. He used homemade nail bombs that were detonated first in Brixton, like I said, in South London, then Brick Lane in East London, and then finally the Admiral Duncan pub in Soho in the West End, which was the deadliest of all three bombs. Shit. Do you remember? 
hearing about it? Yeah, of course. When I bought my place in Brixton, people were like, you are crazy. Why do you want to live there? It's fucking terrifying. And I was like, oh, it's in zone two. But it had a really, really bad reputation. And part of it was the nail bomber. That's just one of many things, yeah, that have happened in Brixton. But it was pretty big at the time. So each bomb contained up to 1,500 four inch or 100 millimeter nails in gym bags or holdalls that were left in public spaces. The bomb killed three people eventually and injured 140 people in total, four of whom lost limbs. And there's a documentary on Netflix called The Nail Bomber Manhunt, which is where I got most of my information. Because I think it was left outside the Iceland. The first bomb, which was on the 17th of April, Mm -hmm. it was in Brixton. It was found by two market traders on Electric Avenue, just in the market area. One of the guys was called Gary Schilling. He moved the bag to a less crowded area after seeing a man acting suspiciously around the bag. It was moved two more times, Michelle. They looked inside it. Then they put it to one side and then they called the police. They were like, shit, what's going on here? Meanwhile, a local crackhead, of which there are many in Brixton, as you'll know, being a former resident, ran through the market, took the bomb out of the bag and ran off with the bag. What? I know. Oh, my God. (laughs) This information was new to me. The police did arrive at the scene just as the bomb detonated at 5.25 p.m. outside the Iceland supermarket, sending nails flying in every direction, blowing glass windows out. Parked cars were damaged. 48 people were injured, including, trigger warning, a one-year-old baby who had had a nail embedded in his head. Fucking hell. It was devastating. Oh, that's so awful. A week later... London's Bangladeshi community was targeted in a bomb planted in Brick Lane on the 24th of April on what the bomber thought would be the busiest market day. But he got the days mixed up. It was Saturday where the bomb was planted instead of Sunday, which meant the streets were much quieter. Yeah, thank God. Again, a bag containing the bomb had been discovered on Hanbury Street by a passerby who took it to the police station only to find the police station was shut. So he put it in his boot of his car for safekeeping while he phoned the police. While he was ringing the police, the bomb went off. Witnesses said that debris was thrown four stories high, injuring 13 passers-by. Quite a lot of debris, but obviously the nails were probably more contained, thank God. So at this point, London is gripped with fear, wondering who is next. Jewish people were panicking. There's a lot of security. Everybody was fearful because it's not just a community that's going to be targeted It's everybody. London is very multicultural. We all mix in all these places. You know, Soho is a Chinese community. I've got the South Korean community on my doorstep. I've got the Portuguese community in Brixton. Stockwell. Yeah, Stockwell, Brixton. The final and most deadly attack was in the heart of the gay community, Old Compton Street, which is where I was having lunch with a friend accidentally on Gay Pride. We didn't (laughs) even know it was Gay Pride that day. We both got (laughs) caught up in it and managed to get there in the end. So it was a bank holiday weekend in April. The bag containing the bomb was left on the floor of the pub, the Admiral Duncan, and it went off just after 6.30 p.m. on a Friday night, sending 500 nails flying at a velocity of 400 miles an hour. Oh, my God. And the thing is, you said they were four inches. That's fucking long. The pub was destroyed and 79 people were injured with many suffering life-changing injuries and extreme mental trauma that still causes stress and anxiety to those affected. Of course. Many of the injured, like I said, at least four of the injured lost legs and still have nails embedded in their spines to this day. Oh, my God. Tragically, three people lost their lives. Friends Nick Moore, 31, John Light, 32, and Andrea Dykes, 27, who was pregnant. And they were in the pub with her husband, who did survive, uh, who was unconscious after the blast. Oh, in a coma, I guess. No, he wasn't in a coma. He was just unconscious because of his injuries. He was badly injured and burnt as well. Oh, my God. And so he woke up to find that both his wife and unborn child had been taken from him which is very, very sad. They were actually there having pre-theatre drinks before going to see Mamma Mia. The bomber retreated after leaving the bag there to a nearby hotel where he watched the carnage unfold on TV. But police were already onto him. They had noticed some recurring images from CCTV because obviously since Brixton, they were on it like a car bonnet and they were searching, searching, searching. 
Let me just quickly tell you something which is a trigger warning okay. about something that the hospital staff had said on this documentary, which is quite shocking to me. They were very traumatised by all of the bomb victims, particularly from the Admiral Duncan bomb. They had tried their best to minimise the impact of the injuries that they were seeing. However, a doctor did say on the documentary that when a bomb goes off in a crowd of plays, it makes their job very difficult because parts of one body can be embedded into another. Oh. So injuries can often be from parts like a limb flying into somebody else, bones, tissue. I'm really sorry, but this is very real. And so for the survivors, it was horrific. The police had been working their asses off behind the scenes. On the 19th of April, which is just after Brixton, they had received a telephone confession for the Brixton bomb from a a neo-Nazi terrorist organisation called Combat 18. Then, after Brick Lane, it was obvious that these attacks were racially motivated. Two hours after the Admiral Duncan bomb, the neo-Nazi White Wolves organisation phoned police to take responsibility. However, police had CCTV images that led them to potentially identify the bomber and thanks to an undercover operative who followed the chairman of the National Front and the BMP, a man called John Tyndall, not a nice person, Oh, they got their man. So this undercover operative known as Arthur, he's all over the documentary. It's fascinating. He would attend meetings where Tyndall would incite members to attack black people or kidnap them and inflict dreadful violence. This is verified by an ex-member named Bernard Omani, who is also an incredible character. Right. He admitted on the documentary that while he was involved in the NF, National Front, he did some really shit, really bad things and that on the whole... They were all Holocaust deniers. And even Arthur, the undercover op, who was anti-racist, and that's what led him to get involved as an undercover operative, he even began to question the Holocaust after being inside the group for so long. Brainwashing. You can imagine it's powerful when you've got all of these people like vehemently denying that this happened. I guess you do start to question yourself. So Arthur knew of David Copeland through the BNP. He knew him as Dave from Barking. (laughs) And he recognised the the CCTV images, so he informed his handlers and they got in touch with police. Also, at the same time, a colleague of Copeland's who worked with him as an engineer on the underground recognised him from the footage and alerted the police about an hour and 20 minutes before the third bomb went off at the Admiral Duncan. Shit, not soon enough. Sadly not. On the 2nd of May 1999, the Metropolitan Police Anti-Terrorist Team arrested and charged 22-year-old David Copeland with murder. They were met with Copeland, who confessed immediately, saying, yep, they were all down to me. I did them on my own. He showed them into his bedroom where there were two Nazi flags hanging on the wall, along with a collection of photographs and newspaper stories about the bombings. It's a fame fame game. Yeah. Yep. So Copeland was a neo-Nazi and a former member of the BNP, and he had a deep hatred for the gay community, as well as other non-white groups. Apparently, while he was preparing the bombs, which were all homemade, Copeland would let his pet rats piss on the nails that he was packing while he was packing the bombs, which caused even more trouble for the victims because this led to devastating infections. Oh, my God. He really, he really wanted to fuck people up. He really thought about it long and hard. Copeland's trial 13 months later at the Old Bailey was attended by three dozen of his victims and their families. It was beginning to look as though his defence would claim him to be of diminished responsibility, Michelle, and he was being medically examined in a bid to plead guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter. But no, 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 not for Bernard Omani. He could not abide this. Yeah. And he hatched a plan. Okay. He began writing to Copeland, pretending to be a keen neo-Nazi sympathizer, a woman Ooh. called Patsy. And they began a friendship, which led to Copeland falling in love with Patsy, <gasps> a.k.a. Big Bernie. Yeah. By the way, I've got to tell you about this guy, Bernie. He's got form. He also wrote to Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe posing as a woman named Belinda. And I don't know what the outcome of that was. I fucking There's love this guy. This he's guy. he's yeah. mad. <laughs> he's incredible. But back to Copeland. He adored receiving letters from Patsy and he told her mm. it was keeping him going in this long wait behind bars for his trial date. Mm. And eventually he confessed to her saying, Dear Patsy, this place is a joke. So are the doctors. They think they're clever, but they are as stupid as the fools in here. Things are not looking bad for my trial. I can't believe that I have fooled all the doctors. Yeah. 
So Bernie sent these letters to the prosecution and they were used in evidence of his mental stability yep. in court. Good. Copeland, up until this point, had been unemotional oh. about all of the, I mean, even, you know, killing a pregnant woman. He just didn't care until Patsy's betrayal was revealed to him and the man's lot of pleas were rejected and he was then convicted of murder in 2000 and given six life sentences. Holy shit. You know, you hear this a lot of murderers who are just completely devoid of any emotion. I'm going to flip back quickly to Bernie Omani, who's an incredible character. Like I said, his experiences of Copeland are documented in his 2005 book called Hate Land. Hmm. But take a look at his Wikipedia page because he was the nail in the coffin for plenty of murderers, especially child murderers. Plus, he was linked to the Essex Boys murders, if you've heard of that. No. And he had an affair with the accused murderer of a woman called Alison Shaughnessy. This woman's called Michelle Taylor, who at the time he had the affair, he didn't think she was responsible. But later on, he does think she's responsible. He needs his own episode, Michelle. Oh, my God. He sounds incredible. Pin burn. He basically fucked a murderer. Wow. Many times. <laughs> Now, I also want to say that Arthur, who is the Cheers, we'll call him, the undercover operative, yeah. he still needs to live his life anonymously undercover oh. and was not interested in the reward for assisting with the capture of the London nail bomber, which was an incredibly large amount of money. Now, he's had at least 10 years inside the British National Party, BNP, and he's put up with being attacked physically by anti-fascists, of which he used to be one. Yeah. But he is just happy enough with the fact that he identified Copeland and has thwarted several attempts for the BNP to get into Parliament here in the United Kingdom. Oh, shit. But what's he sacrificed, you know? There's a Guardian article from May 2021 where he spoke of the contemporary threat from the extreme right. That's two years ago. Yeah. He's saying that there is still a threat from the extreme right because he's in it. And then in July, there was another article written by his handler on the work that they do and continue to do to keep the neo-Nazi threat at bay. And when I say neo-Nazi threat, I mean threat. It's not a good place to be. These people have to sacrifice their lives yep. in order to keep the rest of us in a fair, just society. It's crazy, isn't it? Devoid of hate. I know. Why hate? Guys, let's love. But, you know, I feel like the UK has a long history of this, and I can't really even pinpoint or talk accurately about why you know when you look at everything from the neo-nazi hate groups who were involved with all of the soccer riots the football riots it all seems like the far right the black shirts the mosley there is a lot that mm. did originate in this country but nowadays we do pride ourselves you know great britain prides itself on being one of the most uh liberal and multicultural nations on the globe Yes. And I do think we've come an awfully long way if you compare it to countries like America. Yeah. You know, I'm currently in Sweden where it's probably the most inclusive, tolerant PC. You have to be politically correct here. You can't be like me and not be woke, you know. <laughs> and also in Norway, but then look, they had Anders Bering Breivik go mad. So there's always going to be a, a faction of people who, who feel this Currently way. in Sweden, if I'm correct... There's a right-wing government which had early neo-Nazi leanings. Sure. Like, it's all mixed up. All you need is love, Michelle. The Beatles knew it. Wow, that's fucking fascinating. I knew about the nail bombs in Brixton. Didn't know too much more than every time I went to Iceland, I'd be like, and that's where the nail bomb was. Didn't know a crackhead ran off with a bag. Thanks for all the laughs, Geordie. All the laughs. Pleasure. <laughs> I thought you were talking about bombers, and you were, nail bombers, but I kind of ended up going down a wormhole about the Unabomber. Oh, I don't know much about him. Well, I didn't either. What's wrong with my voice? I suddenly feel like I'm, oh, I don't know. I kind of got interested in the Unabomber because I had a friend come and stay with me recently with her two amazing teenage sons, actually, who were these brilliant conversationalists. They were not on their phones at all. 
Not even once. That's amazing this day and age. Yeah. I actually think one of them might not even have taken his phone on holiday with him. Oh, even better. 15 or 16 and 18, the kids were. I just thought that's fucking amazing. And I sort of didn't connect this with the Unabomber. But while I was chatting to them, they were telling me all about Ted Kaczynski, who is the Unabomber. He's a maths genius, was, I should say. Ted Kaczynski, absolutely incredible maths genius, recreational terrorist, and now turns out a kind of Gen Z hero slash anti-hero. Hero? Yeah. And more than that, he just committed suicide in prison last month. I didn't know that. That's when you said was. I was like, what happened to him? Ripe old age of 81. No. Yep. June 10. And for anyone who's listening in the future, we're talking 2023 here. I thought I need to understand why Ted Kaczynski is having this massive effect on teenage boys. So I did a mini dive into it. And I'll give you a recap for anyone who doesn't know about the Unabomber. Between 1978 and 1995, Ted Kaczynski either posted or hand-delivered homemade letter or parcel bombs to people he considered enemies of nature or to people who were advancing technology in some way that he thought was going to be detrimental to humans. Looking at it now, it was all kind of random because he targeted airlines, computer shops, Mm. but also universities, university lecturers, alongside people who were lobbyists for companies like Big Timber. So I did the nail bomber, but you're doing a mail bomber. Oh my God. Mm? There's only one letter difference. That's right. He was just basically against anyone he thought was helping destroy nature or people who were developing technology. They were all potentials for receiving a Unabomber package. And in the 17 years before he was thrown in jail, he seriously injured 23 people and killed three. Yeah, and at the time he was America's most wanted criminals. Yeah, And if you want to know why he was called the Unabomber, It's because the FBI nicknamed him Unibom, which was short for University and Airline Bomber. Right. But the media jazzed up the name and called him the Unibomber, which I actually think sounds kind of cool. You know, Nana's name was Una. Really? Yeah. Look, when Ted was finally caught, he had been this total survivalist recluse. Yeah. And look, apparently he'd always been a bit of a genius loner. Not good with girls, never really had relationships. Like I said, he was a maths super whiz and he was accepted to Harvard at the age of 15. He'd been given a scholarship, but going to university at 15 when you are socially awkward loner kind of fucked him up. He was smart enough to get in, but he was too young to handle university life. It didn't do him any good. While he was at Harvard, and I find this really fascinating, somehow he ended up being part of a mind control experiment. Oh, MK Ultra. Yeah. Well, this is a thing. Like the dude, a Harvard psychologist called Henry Murray, who had a history of being involved with the US government and their mind control studies, including he was linked with being involved with MK Ultra. So you are on it, Geordie. And for anyone who doesn't know, MKUltra is the CIA's mind control project. This same guy was doing mind control experiments on students at Harvard. They had to do this thing where they would write an essay all about what their aspirations for their life were, um, what made them happy, you know, things like just all about themselves. And then they had to hand that essay in and these psychologists would then go through it and absolutely throw everything they'd said back at them in really aggressive, wow. humiliating, abusive ways to belittle them. What's the point of that? It was all to see, like, can you break down a person by humiliating them oh. using their own words? Fuck. It sounds fucking awful. And the thing is, Ted, little old Ted at age 15 at Harvard, did this every week for two years. Oh, Gosh. Fucked with his head. And then in 1966, he had this weird kind of mental break in a way 
where over a period of a few weeks, he had these intense sexual fantasies of being a woman. How do you know this? It's all online, babe. It's all online. Oh, okay. I, I yeah. haven't talked to Ted. He's dead. Ted is dead. But the thing is, he decided at this moment in his life that he wanted gender reassignment surgery. Okay. So he went to a psychiatrist to talk it over, but he couldn't do it. He could not Why? bring himself to admit these sexual fantasies. So he went to this psychiatrist's appointment and talked about every other fucking thing, but not this one thing. Because, and these are his words, he said, I felt disgusted about what my uncontrolled sexual cravings had almost led me to do. And I felt humiliated. And then he says, he violently hated the psychiatrist. Weird. Wow. And he said, and just then there came a major turning point in my life. Like a phoenix, I burst from the ashes of my despair to a glorious new hope. Interesting. Is this from a book or something that he's written? Has he written a book? Don't ask me that. I'm, I'm sure he has. Okay. I tell it's you. It's just very prosaic words and I doubt it's like in a confession tape, what he just said. No, I mean, he was a really prolific writer and in fact, he did write a manifesto. I'm going to put a pin in that because I'm going to get to that in a minute. Okay. Because this glorious new hope that he said he found after hmm. freaking out and not being not getting that gender reassignment surgery. Well, that hope was a realization that technology was fucking up the world and he was the one that had to stop it. Okay, one man band. Exactly. So in 1969, he resigned from his job at Berkeley where he was a professor, moved to his parents' house in Illinois where he stayed until 1971. When he then moved to a cabin in the middle of fucking nowhere outside Lincoln, Montana, that had no water, no electricity, and he'd built it himself. And I've seen pics of this cabin and it's basically, well, it's a little bit like a Swedish red house. It's um, got a pointy roof. It's a barn. It looks like a, okay. a barn, basically. It's not a cool little cabin that you see on like hipster Instagram accounts. I mean, it does look a bit like murder barn. Murder barn? Yeah, like a barn where you would murder people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh. I could imagine the Piggy Palace looks something like this. Oh, no. If you don't know what I'm talking about. Don't go back. Don't go listen to the cat murder at Piggy Palace. It's a bad one. It's rough. But basically, he wanted to live a simple life. He wanted to unplug and be a primitivist. The thing is, he did a few odd jobs here and there to get money, but he was essentially supported by his family financially. Right. Even though he had wanted to be self-sufficient and a primitivist, even he, unplugging from society, had to go out and you know, get a bit of money here and there. Yeah. But the thing is, he kept seeing nature being destroyed by capitalism and technology and greed. Things like he'd spend days walking to his like favorite hiking spot where there was, you know, cliffs and beautiful ravines and incredible nature only to find a road had been put through it. And after one particularly upsetting experience of this happening, he'd had enough. He just was at the end of his tether. And these are his words. It was from that point on, I decided that rather than trying to acquire further wilderness skills, I would work on getting back at the system, revenge. And that's basically when he became the Unabomber. This is where that inner fury comes to the surface. Mm -hmm. He can do nothing more with it than act out. That's when he was sending all the bombs to people he thought were fucking up, you know, nature or providing technology that was going to ruin lives. But in fact, he was just sending it to regular people living their lives, doing a job and their secretaries and, you know, the other people in the offices causing them death and injury. Yeah. Yeah. There were secretaries who, you know, were completely disfigured, opening up packages. You know, it's really horrific. Yeah. In 1995, Ted wrote to the New York Times saying he would stop sending any more packages and trying to kill people if one of the big newspapers published his anti-modern, anti-tech manifesto called Industrial Society and Its Future. And Janet Reno, who was the US Attorney General at the time, thought it was a brilliant idea to publish his paper if it meant he'd stop sending all of these nail bombs. She also thought that maybe someone out there might get a clue as to who the Unabomber might be. 
So in September 1995, right. that makes sense. yeah, after Penthouse had agreed to publish it, but he okay, said, "Go Penthouse." Well, he said, "No, it's not reputable no. enough. I want a big <laughs> newspaper." Not good enough. Yeah, the Washington Post stepped up and printed all 35,000 words of his manifesto as a special supplement. And it was a fucking smash hit. People could not get enough of what he was saying. I believe the paper had to actually reprint it. Thing is, it was Ted's brother and Ted's brother's wife who read it and went, that's Ted. That's Ted. They were like, that's Ted's ideologies. They're Ted's. I'm writing this from my little murder house in the <laughs> middle of blah, blah, blah. Exactly. And they were like, fucking hell, we need to tell the FBI. We think it's my brother. They went to the FBI and on this tip-off, on April 3, 1996, the police raided Ted's cabin and arrested him after they went through it and found all the bomb-making gear. And in June that year... A federal grand jury indicted Ted on 10 counts of illegally transporting, mailing, using bombs, and he was given eight life sentences without the possibility of any parole. And he was sent to this um, supermax prison, the maximum. They call it a supermax. Can't be nice. In Colorado. But look, circling back to Ted Kaczynski, the ideologist, Hmm. I think the reason... A lot of Gen Zs even know about him, let alone identify with his anti-tech manifesto, is because they are able to separate Ted Kaczynski, the serial bomber, from Ted Kaczynski, the kind of eco-intellectual who wanted to warn us all about the terror of technological advancement well i'm with him as well i kind of feel that way too but the Mm. problem with ted was that he had this uncontrollable rage and he didn't know how to channel it and that could have been due to what happened to him at 15 when he was in the university yeah but i also just think he was you know just one of those loner guys i think he had social anxiety yeah, and and issues with connecting with people. Look, you know, he may even have been spectrumy. He's had a lot of exposure recently. Let's call it neurodivergent. Sorry, neurodivergent. I, I don't know all the woke terms. Sorry about that. <laughs> people, sorry. Netflix is all over him. Um, yeah. There was a four-part documentary on him. There was a dramatised for TV series. I saw with Paul Bettany, very handsome, playing Ted. I only watched about one or two episodes of that. On Manhunt or what was that? Yeah, Manhunt. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because they looked into sort of more the investigation into the Unabomber. Well, hang on. What was the one I saw with Paul Bettany playing the Unabomber? I don't know. I'll find out and and let you know. Because I didn't watch them. Honestly, like it would have been hours of my life if I watched all these things. There's also another one called Ted K, which is like a movie length biopic actually set in Montana near the cabin where Ted really lived. And apparently that cabin has been moved and put into some kind of museum. Like people fucking love him. Yeah, really. You know, it's funny because when you started talking about it and then as you discussed the gender uh, reassignment that Mm. he didn't get, that's when I thought, oh, this is going to be the link. This is going to be why he's the hero stroke anti-hero. I didn't realise it was going to be about the technology. But yes, of course, that's pressing, especially with AI on our doorsteps and other things, you know, fossil fuel burning and whatnot. Exactly. And the thing is, what he's saying is so prosaic in terms of what we now know, that people identify with everything he's saying. They're all like, Ted was right. Ted Kaczynski was right. He might have been a fucking nail-bombing serial murderer, but he's fucking right. But in in order to make the T-shirts, you'd have to kind of separate the nail-bomber from the anti-technology campaigner, and that might be difficult to have the Ted Was Right T-shirts made. Well, the thing is, there are lots of people who are really pro-Ted. Like, there's a right-wing news, uh, I think it's Fox News, actually, uh, host, called Tucker Carlson, who basically said Ted's manifesto was a smart analysis of systems and large organisations. And there's an Arizona state candidate called Blake Masters who recommends Ted's manifesto. This is my next question. What's happened to Ted's manifesto? Is it still being used as a a jumping off point of how to to manage this new technological phase that we're in? And these Gen Zs are are reading it, you know, 
and really gleaning a lot from it. And the opening line actually of the manifesto reads, the industrial revolution and its consequences Mm. have been a disaster for the human race. So anyone who is looking at the fucking disaster we're in now with climate change and everything else, like you say, AI, technology, he's saying point zero where everything went wrong was the industrial revolution. It's kind of, at the time, pretty shocking stuff. Like when he put that manifesto out, Mm. now I think it's pretty bog standard dinner party chit chat. You know, people are always talking about that stuff. Not not go Ted. No, but like even, you know, Greta Thunberg, Boris Johnson, they're all in a roundabout way saying the same things. Boris Johnson? Yeah, because he, I believe, had said things about technology and that kind of stuff. No? I don't know. I'm just trying to think why he would. And I, my mind immediately was like, how can he monetize this? He wants to regulate. Fair enough. We do need to regulate. But what's the oh, – I went immediately to thinking – What's his angle? Unlike Greta, who just wants to... He's, I mean, that's true. Greta really believes that Boris Johnson, he was a puppet. No, he's just a newspaper columnist. Let's just focus on Greta Thunberg. <laughs> Another thing that Ted was crazy about was the world's obsession with economic growth. And he's right. You're like, everything is about growth strategies. And he said that by having strategies of economic growth... We are, and these are his words, piling up environmental problems that our grandchildren will have to live with. He'd been mulling over all of these thoughts since he went fucking primitive in 1971. So he could see the writing on the wall. And he also said essentially that industrialization has brought about a population explosion that has done untold damage to nature and will take a very long time for the scars to heal and that we have to turn economic growth and I think population growth into economic and population shrinkage if we're going to survive. And what he wrote about in 95 is so zeitgeisty today. This idea that technological progress is going to pose also actually an existential threat to the human race by turning people into, and these are his words, engineered products and cogs in the social machine, where people would basically just become tech zombies that we don't question anything but we are just passive cheerleaders, despite the fact that we know they're bad for us. We know they're bad for our society and we know they're bad for the environment. It seems that Gen Z kind of sees the truth in Ted Kaczynski's fear of technology, destroying minds, destroying nature, destroying society, because their whole life is kind of exactly as he predicted. From the second kids are born, they are consuming digital media. They're, you know, exposed to screens. A lot of these kids don't have real life social skills. They're living online. They feel hopeless about the future. They're terrified about climate change. They're seeing governments be useless when it comes to, you know, reducing emissions. You know, they're gaming addicts. They're social media addicts. It's not great. And with all of that in mind, I think Ted Kaczynski's manifesto strikes a chord, especially with this subgroup who I hadn't heard of before, but they're called NEETS, N-E-E-T. And that stands for not in education, employment or training. Dull bludges. It's basically young kids, except that it kind of aligns with this whole segment of Gen Z dudes who are socially awkward. Essentially, they're isolated. They don't want to fit in kind of incels in a way. And who was that? If we look at it, Ted. Mm. He was basically a neat. And he opted out of society, live in a cabin Mm. with no water, no electricity. And I think Gen Z, there's a segment of Gen Zs who really relate to that. Gen Zs, if you're listening to this, please write in and let me know if I'm getting this right. Well, we've right. got our one Gen Z that listens to us. Come on. Hiya, Cal. Cal the pal. Cal's our pal. Tell us about what you think about Ted. I also think that Ted didn't just like talk the talk. He walked the walk. You know, he uh-huh. lived his ideology. Yes, okay, he'd kill people to try and protect society and the environment. Oh, that wasn't good. But he lived in a fucking yeah. cabin with no water. He lived his truth. And I think that 
it's rare, especially considering that what he was doing is the opposite to social media. He was living his real life, whereas social media is not all about, but a lot about covering up your real life and presenting this image yeah. of my life's amazing. That's not the reality for a lot of people. And we know that social media really can fuck up people's self-image and their life on some level I think we can all relate to what Ted is saying loss of privacy being served ads that are targeted you know when you've had a conversation with your sister about going to Greece or whatever and then all of a sudden you're served up these ads about Greece right freaking out when you when you lose your phone for a day or, or forget it at home yeah that's true listen tell me what happened to Ted in the end how did he end his life I don't want to know details but what was the story about him taking his own life? Was he alone? What uh, happened? Well, interestingly, his dad was diagnosed with cancer and killed himself. And Ted was diagnosed with cancer and killed himself. Did the same. Yeah. Right. That's how he died. I think Ted had some real concerns about where society was going. And I think he's fucking right because you know how I feel about privacy. You know how I feel about the fact that everything we do now is just data for people to mine and to basically target us. Even though we know all this stuff, we have gone down this tech road so far down, we can't give it up. We love it and we hate it at the same time. And I think maybe for Gen Zs, maybe Ted Kaczynski taps into this idea of a life that will never be a realistic option for them. No one really can run away to a cabin and live a reclusive life with no amenities or a phone. Now we have moved into the next generation as well of Anthropocene, I think it's called. It means that the impact of humans on the planet is now irreversible. And can you imagine what that must do to your mindset when you've got your whole life ahead of you? Existentially, absolutely. No one can live without a digital footprint. I mean, even here in Sweden, you cannot pay for a single thing in cash. It's all cashless. Wow, okay. If you're not connected to a bank account or to your phone, you can't get by anymore. We are so far down the road. We are in servitude to our phones, not the other way around. That's why, circling it right back to why I wanted to talk about this, was because those kids who came to visit, they basically ignored their phones. Yes, they have one, but they are so influenced by this Ted Kaczynski idea that they are moving away from tech and trying to interact as little as possible with it. And I thought it was fucking brilliant. So well done, guys. Well done. And maybe that is the movement in that direction for the next generation. Who knows? And maybe for us too, I'd love to use my phone less. Like we couldn't do this podcast without tech. We like couldn't. everything we do is all about like where we are. And basically he had this brilliant manifesto. Unfortunately, he killed some peeps. There you have it. Unfortunate, really. Thank you, Michelle. That was incredible. What a thought provoking conversation. My pleasure. My pleasure. There's not really much more to say, actually, than we've run the course of our tech. We've gone nail to mail. We've gone race hate to technophobia, technophia, which is very real, and the state of the world today. I mean, there's a lot more than just the laughs, isn't there, Michelle? In fact, there wasn't very many laughs this week, but we do aim to not educate but discuss. Probably got every fucking thing wrong in my story. I hope that it's a nice thought-provoking episode for for you lovely eavesdroppers out there. And once again, don't forget, please do support us in the British Podcast Awards voting. And if you haven't signed up to all the other things that we have, like our Instagram accounts and our Facebook accounts, please do that too, because we like to give back. And we love it when you write in. We love that. Get out there, get voting. Tell your friends, even if they've never listened to us, shame on them. Vote for us. Tell your mum. We'll take anything. We'll take all the votes. Just <laughs> help us. Vote eavesdrop it. And on that note, Michelle, I think it's enough. Enough is enough. Let's just <laughs> leave them with this little manifesto of ours, which is wherever you are. Whatever you do, just, just keep, keep eavesdropping. eavesdropping. Eavesdropping, 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 eavesdropping.